We'll now hear from Micah Redding on transhumanism and the Christian story. Micah is a writer, musician, and instigator of troubling thoughts. He's traveled three continents, has a degree in computer science, was raised as a preacher's kid, and once slept on the tarmac of an airport in a third world country. He loves Oklahoma, Seattle, and the fictional state of Kansas. <clears throat> Mostly, he's in pursuit of life on the edge of the transhuman wilderness. Micah. Thank you guys for uh, having me here. Um, I was telling somebody earlier, I think I'm the token non-Mormon here, uh, so I'm, I appreciate you inviting me. Um, but uh, what I want to talk about is the, the connection between Christianity and transhumanism and the ways I've seen that done in the past or attempted in the past and the way that I think makes the most sense out of that. So uh, when, I was, when I was young and I first uh, was taught about humanism, I was thrilled because here someone had captured the essence of many of the core concepts of Christianity and packaged it for a secular world. And then when I was a little bit older and I discovered transhumanism, I felt the same thing because the essence of what I valued most about my religion had finally been captured in a philosophy. Um, I soon figured out that other people did not see that the same way I did. And uh, I was shocked that not only did most transhumanists uh, not consider themselves religious, but actually considered Christianity and transhumanism to be antithetical. Um, and even humanists, uh, as, one, as one humanist told me, um, humanism is the bastard stepchild of Christianity, and the two haven't been on speaking terms since humanism left home. So... Um, I, I think and I hope that there's a better way to frame that uh, historically and sociologically. And um, the way I do that myself is, is I think that, well, I suspect that all cultures periodically have to send off expeditions to explore subsets of their ideas in a way that the mother culture cannot really fully do. And um, the hope being that if they're successful, that they can come back with stories of these vast unconquered territories and the tales of the dangers on the way there and the safe pathways uh, to get there. And so I think this is what has happened in our history uh, with Christian Europe sending people off to, to explore the ideas that became known as humanism. And they returned, and that return was so successful that the world has changed to the point that many of us now live in liberal secular democracies fueled by worldwide capitalism. And so now humanism has sent off its own expedition to explore the ideas of transhumanism. And I think that it's time to come back to the mother culture and explain what we found. But unfortunately, I think a lot of times when that happens, the people who have gone on these, these explorations have been so profoundly affected by what they've seen and the ideas they've, they've encountered that they are no longer recognizable. And they may speak in ways that are so foreign that they are ne never fully accepted back. And so a work of translation is necessary. But for many of the people, I think, who originally tried to translate, do that work of translation between religion and transhumanism and, and connecting, connecting the two, um, their relationship with their own religion was different than that of the mainstream. And so their, their work of translation looked a little bit like taking a list of transhumanist ideas and a list of religious concepts and playing connect the dots based on superficial similarities. And, uh, for example, Eric von Daniken has compared um, the ascension of Elijah with the uh, whirlwind and the fiery chariot to uh, vertical liftoff and spaceflight. I think that misconstrues both the impulses of those who are interested in space travel and the impulses of most religious people who probably don't see the significance of a great prophet's ascension as having something to do with UFOs. So I think that we can do a better work of translation than that, and I think that the, the proper place to start is uh, with the beginning of the Jewish story. And my, my understanding of that is that... Um, Judaism was born into a world which had a lot of creation myths that looked a little bit like here were a lot of gods and they were sick and tired of their work. And so they created human beings to do their menial tasks. And so humanity was created to be slaves. Judaism is a revolt against that understanding. And so right at the beginning of the Jewish story, you have some of the most significant words in literature. God created man in his image 
and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And so humanity wasn't created to be slaves, but was to created to actually embody the essence of the creativity of God himself. And I think that's what you see throughout the Jewish narrative. And so when you get to Abraham, you have a man born into a world in which time is viewed as cyclical and uh, there is no true past or future because everything simply repeats and there's no personal significance or identity because no true change can happen. And in that world, Abraham walks out into the wilderness in pursuit of a future he cannot yet see. And in doing that, he writes his identity into history and in a sense creates history itself. This is why Abraham is known as the father of faith, the father of forward-looking and is significant to Jews and Christians and Muslims. And so I think that continues on, that idea of human significance and individual change moves and grows bigger as you as you move along. And so when you get to the Christian scriptures, you don't have a rejection of what comes before, but an intensification of it. And just like consciousness is not a rejection of life, but an acceleration of the idea, I think Christian Christianity tries to be an exponential return on some of the concepts developed in the Jewish scriptures. And so right at the beginning, you have the story of this human who is really living out what it means to be in the image of God, what it means to be a true human being, and who is always inviting other people into that humanity with him. And as that's carried out throughout the New Testament, what you see is the anticipation and the bringing into being of a new kind of humanity, a humanity no longer defined around geography or the situations of one's birth. Because I think I would call these people the first transhumanists. They, they were looking forward and, and calling out a humanity and a meaning to humanity that was fluid and dynamic and always changing. And I think that is the proper connection. The Apostle Paul said that there is neither male nor female, slave nor free, Jew nor Greek, breaking the boundaries of identity along every dimension of the ancient world. And so I think the connection between transhumanism and Christianity is not in superficial speculations about the future or uh, superficial similarities between different concepts or in the rapture of the nerds, but actually in an understanding of, of what it means to be human that is fluid and dynamic and always changing and always requiring the moving of boundaries and redefinition of terms. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. I love the metaphor. You are not the only non-Mormon speaker. There are quite a few others. Um, I love the metaphor of going and exploring this territory and bringing things back, and also the fact that we got so changed by it that we are unrecognizable. That is beautiful. Um, I want to ask you how, how you've, what your sojourn these brief days in Mormon land has been like and what you're going to bring back to your community um, from doing it, maybe also from your prior experiences with us. Mm -hmm. um, I feel we have a lot to learn from you, and I'm, I'm grateful that you came out. I, I was remarking to my colleague here that um, in, in the church, in the LDS church in, in Mormonism, we don't have good preaching, and you are obviously the son of a preacher, man. <laughs> um, and I, I really wish we could cultivate that skill of public speaking and of delivering an, a good sermon. And I, I hope, I, I at least try to do it when I can. Thank anyway, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, to, uh, to address your question, what I've, what I've learned and, and, and gathered, um, you know, I've only been here since, since last night. So there's, uh, there's a lot for me to learn. But, um, you know, one of the reasons that I got involved um, with uh, some of you initially and um, struck up the conversation and uh, was was because I was looking for someone who who was uh, really um, aggressively interested in talking about the intersection of these types of ideas and between uh, spirituality and and the future and transhumanism and singularity type issues those those kind of things um, and I really found very very little of that. And I, I think I want to um, uh, commend you guys for not only having having that, but doing that in a sustained and uh, very mature way. So I appreciate that.